and gentlemen, now live in New York City, it's Rush Limbaugh. I, I really want to apologize for getting a late start, but it was your fault. <laughs> but there's a, good, there's a good thing that happened. I understand it's raining very hard outside, which means that the Occupy people are finally getting a shower, <laughs> cleaning up. I, um, it's been uh, five years since um, I appeared here in New York in person like this. It's been too long. I remember I, I arrived here in 1988 from Sacramento, California, and I learned so many things when I got to this town. One of the first things that I encountered was, I was reading, I think, a New York Post, page six, and there was a, a story about edible panties. <laughs> remember saying, I didn't know they had taste buds down there. And, so this is going to be a fun ride. We were just talking backstage about, about Herman Cain. Let me know, the last thing I heard about Herman Cain was that he's considering getting out of the race. Where there is smoke, and they smoke, there's fire, there's generally a couple of media people rubbing two sticks together to create the... <laughs> but I have been, I'm, I'm trying to figure all this out. This whole Herman Cain thing, when it started with these, uh, the sexual harassment babes all popped up. And, and the original claim was he made gestures that were not overtly sexual. One of, them, one of the women said, yeah, well, he, he said that I came up to here on him. What? And I've been trying to tell, what is sexually harassing about this? It is hot in here, isn't it? It is very warm. Uh, now we have this woman, 13-year affair. If you're Herman Cain, how do you think this isn't going to come out? If you're running for office, now that the woman that has been working with this 13-year woman, uh, the, claiming that she had the affairs, work with, I never heard her mention Herman Cain's name. So there's a lot, there's a lot of mystifying things about this. And the, and the whole Republican race is... Uh, is, is, is kind of troubling and interesting at the same time. For example, Romney. If you look at the polling data, Romney's never gotten more than 25 or 30 percent of the Republican vote, no matter where the poll is taken, any state, nationally, or what have you. There have been a series of candidates that have popped up and have been the anti-Romney. Newt's the latest one, but Bachman was, Rick Perry was at one time. And the race is, is said to be unsettled because of this, but what it looks like to me is that overall, people just don't view Romney as conservative enough, and that's why he can't get above 25 or 25, maybe 28, 30% in all of this, and some of these other people do rise up. One of the things that, that uh, people say to me all the time is, when are you going to endorse? When are you going to put somebody over the top? And I say, it's not my job, it's theirs. They have to do it. They're the ones that have to get traction. And it really is serious. Uh, I can remember when I started my program in Sacramento in 1984, three years there, move it to New York in 1988. It was a lot different then than it is now. Uh, and I must, I must tell you, there are the, the, the fun factor in, uh, in doing the program is harder to come by now than it was. I, I remember one of the first things that happened when I was in Sacramento, there was, I used a philosophy of illustrating absurdity by being absurd, and I still do it. 
when the situation warrants. I remember a minister in Ohio claimed that there was a satanic message in the Mr. Ed theme song and he wanted the song, the TV show, taken off the air. <laughs> and now I could say what I just said on the radio and be done with it. And I, I thought, I'm going to have some fun with this. I'm going I'm to actually illustrate how absurd and silly this Ohio minister is. He said that if you got the Mr. Ed TV show theme song, you play it backwards, there's a satanic message in it. So I just, at the time, I was doing the Great Peace March for Global Nuclear Disarmament Updates. Slim Whitman was my theme song, Una Paloma Blanca. A bunch of leftists were marching from coast to coast against nuclear weapons. They were trying to get everybody to nuclear disarm. It was a big thing in the late 80s, mid 80s. And I was making fun of them with the Slim Whitman tune. So I decided to illustrate the absurdity of the Ohio minister by finding a satanic message in the Slim Whitman song. So I went to the production studio and I, we found a way. And you can't play records backwards. There's no way to do this. So even if there was a satanic message in the Mr. Ed theme song, there's no way to hear it. <laughs> you need special broadcast equipment to do this. So we went in. In the production room, we, we recorded the song backwards and had a friend of mine put a message in it through a device called a harmonizer, which makes the voice sound any way you want it to sound. I opened my program the next day saying, ladies and gentlemen, I have um, been made aware of something due to the good work of an Ohio minister that has led me to discover that I have been possessed. <laughs> Unwittingly so. And I have exposed you to this, and I am seriously thinking that I must resign. I'm not going to tell you what happened or what it is, because I don't want to spread it any further. Well, this created curiosity people wondering what happened. They started calling the manager of the radio station to get an explanation. <clears throat> I played it as though I was being forced to explain what this was all about. Next day I said, I'm under duress. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been told that I must explain what's happened here. I'm very uncomfortable doing this. Um, but there is an Ohio minister who found a satanic message in the Mr. Ed television show theme song. And it just got me to thinking. Uh, I play a lot of music on my program. I wanted to find out how widespread satanic messages are in music. And ladies and gentlemen, I have found a satanic message in a song I have been playing, and you have heard it. You have been subliminally affected by it. And I can't tell you how guilty I feel, how horrible I feel. And I think if it's happened once, it could happen again, even though I've discovered it now. I don't know how I can go on. So people would call it, well, what is it? No, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to go any further with this. I've been forced to tell you this much already. We're in day two of this now. This preachers, clergymen, start calling the radio station, asking the general manager, what is going on? People are calling me saying that your station's playing the devil. <laughs> the general manager comes to me and says, how long are you going to go with this? And I said, the way it's going, I think I can get five days out of it. <laughs> So he says, well, you, 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 you better be um, careful with this because people, and this was an instructive thing for me too, he said, you better be careful because people uh, are believing this. I said, I know, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll take, by the time I'm finished with this, they're going to think I'm the funniest, most creative guy they have ever heard. Okay, fine. So the next day, day three of this, um, I finally said, hey, folks, now it's gotten out of my control. Local ministers had called the radio station and they have demanded that this satanic message be played so that you know what it is. So I said, it's, it goes back to this Ohio minister when I heard him say that there was a satanic message in the Mr. Ed theme. I played the Slim Whitman song, Una Paloma Blanca, that we use for our global nuclear peace, arm, uh, peace update. Played it backwards, and lo and behold, 
there's a, a satanic message in it. Now, I know I've not played the song backwards for you, but it's still there. And this Ohio minister said that you can hear it just like you can hear it in the Mr. Ed theme. People start calling, you've got to play it. I'm going to, but I think you ought to, folks, you need to take great care in listening to this because this is... <laughs> to shorten this story, I played it. Song starts backwards. Sounds better that way than forwards. <laughs> and at about 30 seconds in, the message that we had recorded through the harmonizer was this. Beelzebub, yes, it's me, the old devil himself, <laughs> lurking right here in the Slim Whitman record grooves. <laughs> Tell me, how did you find this so easily? My disciples would be happy to know that you were able to find us like this. Well, since you found us... I gotta be heading on down the line, way down. And then play the song back up and play the satanic message three or four times, and I'm thinking, this is day three now. Okay, people are gonna finally realize I've been poking fun at the Ohio minister. I've taken a little news story that long and made five days out of it. And I'm looking at my call screener who's gonna look a panic on her face. <laughs> I start taking calls, and honest to God, folks, first call said, uh, I have every Slim Whitman record. There. <laughs> Should I? What should I do? I'm going, I'll go. Taught me something. I said, if I were you, I'd burn them. No. no. Really? Yes. Burn them. A couple of more people called in, and, and uh, they believed it, too. And I was really, it was, it was, now here I'm thinking I got an invitation of Johnny Carson coming. This is going to establish me as uh, really a great satirist and so forth. And people bought it. Until this last call, one guy calls up and says, you know what? You can't fool me. I've heard all of this. You think we're all a bunch of idiots out here. Let me tell you something. I have that record. <laughs> now my turntable doesn't play backwards. But I have put the needle on the back end of that song and I have spun it backwards and I have tried to find it and it ain't there. You are lying to us. <laughs> and so, I had to think fast. I said, sir, what year was your turntable made? <laughs> he said 1983. I said, well, see, that's the problem. Your turntable was made uh, before new disgronification circuitry. <laughs> you mean if I go buy a new turntable and I play that record backwards just like I'm trying to, I'll hear it? Yes, sir. It's exactly what I do. <laughs> now, the reason I tell you this is, is uh, and it's, this is one of my greatest hits. This, this is uh, uh, something I'll never forget happening because it, it was, it's, 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 it's like, oh, there's another event like it as well. From Sacramento to New York, remember now, this is the mid-80s, late-80s, and at that time, the defense budget, I guess as it always is, was a hot topic, how much we're going to spend on defense. And I have always been a big defense budget guy, love the military, I just think these people... I really... They, um... Realize those... Those, those, people, those people volunteer to do what 99.5% of the country would not do. I, I just think that they're just, I love them, I have... I, the, older, the older I get, the more in awe I am of military people and what they've done and, and what they do, and particularly now how they volunteer to do it. But back in the mid-80s, this discussion to defense budget, and one of the ways the left tries to stifle any debate about things is to say, well, you didn't serve in the military. I got calls like this. When you had a chance in Vietnam to kill commies, you didn't go, so you don't have the right to talk about it. And I'd listen to this, and I'd respond to them, and I'd have fun with it. But after a while, it got to really tick me off, this kind of thinking and talk. And so... After I'd moved to New York, somehow the subject comes up, and 
during a call exactly like this, I decided to try a different tack. And I said, you know what, sir, you have a point. You know, I come from a small town in Missouri. My dad was a powerful man in that town, a town of 25,000 people. My family, we ran that town. And I told my dad back in 1960, and I said, Dad, I, I, I really I don't want to, I don't want to go Vietnam. So he went down to the draft board and he wrote him a $3,000 check, and I got a 4F. <laughs> that happened to be the very end of the program, and I'm thinking, another home run. I have just illustrated it. Finally, I had it with these people. I've had it up to here, not here, but here. <laughs> So <laughs> I got home about two hours later, and the phone is ringing. This is my dad. <laughs> so, I can't repeat verbatim. <laughs> Son, what the hell did you say? So I told him, he said, don't you understand? They believe you, son. You can't, your audience believes you. You can't, you can't do that. And the rest of the family from Tennessee, Illinois, they were all calling my dad, suggesting that I be taken off the radio as destroying the family name and reputation. <laughs> we don't pay off draft boards, they were saying. How many of you believe it, by the way? I mean, it's so absurd. Go and write the draft board a check for three grand. I know it's the kind of thing Democrats do, but we don't do it. I would have never suggested do it. I'm, I'm looking out here. Some of you believe it happened. See? I can see some of your faces. Some of you look like you're stunned that you paid money to come here tonight after you heard this. No, 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 no. Didn't happen. But it, it, th these two things were a, a, a really educational, informative thing for me about the audience and my credibility and the fact that, that people do believe me, that take me seriously, which, by the way, it's, it's a valuable thing and it's, it's something I treasure. Uh, it, it is key, by the way, to, to, my, to my success, is, is the relationship that I have had with you all and everybody in the audience. But my point with all of this is, when I do show prep today, and I'm, I, I wondered if I should have admitted this, I wanted to tell this story, and I thought long and hard whether or not I should actually admit this to you tonight when I came out here, because it, even though I'm saying it to you, it's something I might not say on the radio. When I prep the show today, like that Ohio minister thing just hit me just, just like that. And even though it was the late 80s, mid 80s, Ronald Reagan's second term, and the media hated Reagan, and the times were politically intense, but the country wasn't on the brink then. Uh, it is now. Now we, I, I, can't, I can't get past the fact that if this guy in the White House gets four more years, you and I are not going to recognize the country we grew up in. It's that serious to me. And at the time, and I... I don't, and I, I know that, that humor is, is, a, is a great way to deal with things, and sometimes using humor can even be persuasive. But there's not a whole lot that seems funny to me right now. Uh, I mean, sure, you can make fun of Michelle getting booed at NASCAR, <laughs> but really... You don't laugh at that, you cheer at it, don't you? I mean, I, I freaking cheer when I hear that Michigan. I mean, I come to New York, I expect to get booed, you know, like she goes to NASCAR. But you all didn't boo me. <laughs> so, now, I, uh, it's probably stunning you because there's still a lot of fun, and, and, and the fun factor on the radio show is, is there. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a fine, fine line for me because I really, 
Remember my dad telling me in, when I was, it's 1963, so 12 years old, uh, and John Kennedy had just been elected, and my dad said to my brother and me, he said, if you boys aren't careful, you're going to end up slaves. And to him that meant communism was going to take over, the Great Depression, World War II, Khrushchev banging the chair. Those are the formative events in his life, and he took it all very seriously. And my brother and I just laughed at him, ah, just like when he talked about the Depression. Ah, dad, dad, that's when you were growing up. We're never going to have anything like that. Here we are. Not in a Great Depression, but for some people it is. For way too many Americans it is. This is not the country that I grew up in. It's not too late to save it, but it, it, for me, it's become, I've been doing this 23 years. And I've, I get up every day and I prep the program and it's never been more important to me than it is today. In all these years. And there's a part of me, I've, I've done very well. I've had, I've had more success than I deserve. I have been blessed. And folks, it rips my heart out to have it happen when so many others in the country are going through what they're going through. I, I, I wish... You know, we're all conservatives, and we love people, and we want everybody to do well. We want the best for everyone. We don't care. We don't care what their race is or their, or their sexual orientation or gender. We, do, we want a great country. We want people out there trying to be the best they can be. We want people getting up every day and pursuing excellence and pursuing self-interest, because that's what makes everybody the best they can be, and to whatever degree they want to be. Uh, now we've got a president and an administration. This is the New York Times. This is a major thing. This is what's it, Monday. It was yesterday, the New York Times. The Obama regime has decided that in order to get reelected, they're just going to forget working white Americans. They're going to throw them out of the coalition. They, they can't win going after that group. They think they've lost working white Americans. So their group now is that bunch across the street and the Occupy people and the losers in life who have this entitlement mentality and the elite professors and all these other clowns, pointy-headed academics who couldn't hammer a nail if their life depended on it. So this administration... This administration has basically said to the backbone of America, to the people who make this country work, we're not interested in you. Now, these are the old Reagan Democrat types uh, in, in many ways, but stop and think of this. This was, this was uh, in, a, in an op-ed column by a guy named Thomas Edsel, who used to work at the uh, New York Times. He's a big leftist, or maybe the Washington Post. They put this out there as though it's no big deal. Yep, the, the administration has uh, a calculation just to abandon... I don't mean this in a racial sense, by the way. I, I, don't interpret it this way. They do. But I'm not interpreting it that way. When they talk about uh, they have decided to just sacrifice the votes of working people, what does that tell you? What does that tell you their design is? What does that tell you the agenda is? This is a, this is a president and an administration Tell you another story. A friend of mine, I wish I could tell you his name, but I can't uh, because he came to me privately Saturday night. I get up Saturday morning and there's a text on my, on my phone. Do you have time for a visit tonight between 5 and 7 from an old friend? That's sure. Texted back, come on by. You would know this guy. You would know who he is. He's not a political person. He's not known in political circles at all, not by the people who know him. He is involved, but he's not known that way. He came by right on time and was near tears, telling me how worried he is about the country. And told me some things that I was surprised to hear from him. He really started railing on President Obama. I said, "This Obama is destroying the country. I, I'm so worried. What? What we just we've we've." And then 
Finally got to it. My antenna went up. He said, you just, we've got to find some people who can put it all aside and work together to solve these problems. And I looked at him and uh, I said, no. Um, I said, the last thing we need to do is work with them. Uh, what we need to do is beat them. We need to defeat them. Now, this is a guy. And this is what we're up against, folks. This, this, this man's a billionaire. He is very savvy. He's smart in his world. While telling me what he thought of Obama, he's mentioning names of Democrats that he likes. And I said, wait a minute, there's no difference. If you're going to tell me what you just told me about Obama, then you've got to think that about every other Democrat because they are the same. The Democrat Party spawned Obama. Obama is the Democrat Party. And if you're going to succeed in stopping him, you've got to stop the Democrat Party. If you've been sent here, this is what I think happened. If you've been sent here to try to tell me that it's up to me to get together with some of these people to solve these problems, I'm sorry, I don't want to work with them, I don't want to talk to them, I want to cream them. I want to defeat them. And <clears throat> it's, I said, listen to yourself. I said, I said, listen to yourself. The things he was telling me about Obama, the things that you say to each other, the things that we all feel, the things that we're all afraid of, this guy's not interested. Like, uh, um, one of the things that came up was the super committee. He said, you know, we've just got to find a way. I said, let me tell you. I said, I'll call him Zeke. That way it'll never be known who he is. Zeke, don't you understand the super committee was designed to fail? It was never intended to succeed. Oh, no. No. Oh, yes, it was. Why? Why do you say there were good people on that? No, there aren't any good people on the committee. If there were good people on the committee, they would have done something about it longer. The purpose of that thing is to make sure nothing got done. Obama's invested $1 billion in a re-election campaign rooted in a do-nothing Congress. There's no way the Democrats are going to let anything come out of that committee. If the Republicans had agreed to a massive tax increase, they wouldn't have agreed to it. Oh, no. Yes. Damn straight. You mean even if the Republicans had agreed to attack? I'm telling you, the last thing they were going to get out of this super committee was any kind of a deal. Obama's investing too much money. He cannot run on his record. There's not one thing Barack Obama has done that can say, elect me for more of this. Nobody wants more of it. Well, I take it back. I take it back. See, Here's the rub. That's the sad thing. There are a lot of people that do want more of it. People across the street, people down occupy this, occupy this, occupy that. They want more of it. Do you believe the number of people on food stamps in this country is up by 50% in the last three years? In the 40 millions? of people on food stamps. We now got breakfast at school. We have lunch at school. And now, dinner at school. You know what? I've, I, my parents have both passed away. I lost a great resource. My dad died. I would love to have him alive and say, Dad, you guess what they're doing in Memphis? School dinner. Ah. Uh, what is the normal reaction? School dinner? What is home for? What are parents for? What is this? Of course, in Memphis, the media writes this story as, oh, how wonderful this is. They get the violins playing school dinner. Uh, all it is 
is a sop to the SEIU, the unions. They run the cafeterias. It's more union jobs, and all that is is a money laundering operation for the Democrats. The stimulus bill. Finally, after what is it now, almost two and a half years, the vaunted Congressional Budget Office finally admits that Obama's porculous bill will be an ultimate drag on the economy. No kidding, thanks very much, two and a half years after it's over. And you know where all the money went? The money went to state employees and other federal employees. It didn't go to shovel-ready jobs. School, it's a, I get so frustrated with people's stupidity. So we spent $800, $900 billion on rebuilding the roads, rebuilding the schools, the bridges, all this wonderful sounding crap that doesn't need to be done. Nothing happens. All we do is make sure teachers and so forth and firemen and cops don't get laid off because they're union people and they pay dues, which goes back to the Democrat Party. And then after that doesn't work, Obama comes back for 60 million more to rebuild roads, bridges, schools. People, what is this? We tried it once. Well, we didn't try it. We've authorized this money and it didn't work and we don't have the money in the first place to be spending on any of this. So, you know, I, I, I say that people don't want any more of it, but clearly a lot of Americans do. Now, I don't believe that we have reached tipping point. A lot of people do. It's very easy to be seduced by negativism and pessimism. I think human beings are naturally inclined to pessimism. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't find people making millions of dollars writing books on how to think positively. <laughs> it's, like, it's like great moderates in American history. The book doesn't exist. Uh, how to think negatively and destroy your life doesn't exist either. People already know how to do that. But the power of positive thinking and all, people spend millions of dollars buying this. So it's very easy to get taken in by a media. See, I believe at the end of the day that people like us, uh, identified as conservatives, I don't believe it, I know it, in terms of the people of the country, we are the majority in terms of thinking and the way we live our lives, but it's not reflected anywhere. Uh, you watch any of the network news shows, all we are is laughed at, made fun of, impugned, and all of the cultural rot that's out there is built up as what's normal because our opponents don't want any value judgments whatsoever. They don't want any assessment of what's right or wrong. They want situational morality. They don't want to have to be uh, told that the way they're living is anything other than normal. And so we can easily get caught up in this notion that we're shrinking, that the people who really want to save the country and save it from, from the direction we're going is a small minority. We don't have a chance. But I just look at the, two, the 2010 midterm elections. It was a shellacking. And it's the Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street exists for one reason. And that's because there is no spontaneous love and adoration for Barack Obama anymore. So they have to create it. And they have to make it look like it's spontaneous. They are so jealous of the Tea Party, I can't. They are so envious. They can't stand it. And now, now they're out there telling themselves that the Tea Party is fading away that the Tea Party doesn't have any interest anymore, that the Tea Party's not rallying, we don't see them, you know, Occupy Wall Street's taking over. What they don't understand is that the Tea Party's not really a party, and it doesn't have meetings, per se, and there's no single organizational leader. It's just us. You know, it's just... And who are we? Well... Most of the Tea Party people, or a good percentage of them, are people who have never, ever been formally involved in politics at all. They just got fed up. They were shocked, scared, stunned to see what was happening to the country with all of this mindless spending, all the debt being run. They know what it means. They know what it means for the future of themselves and their kids and their grandkids, and it isn't good. And so they started going to town hall meetings wanting to be heard for the first time. And because it was spontaneous and because it was genuine 
and because it was real. Obama and the Democrats and the media are scared to death of it because they have to manufacture that emotion. They had it. They had it in 2008. You know, all this, uh, I'm going to lower the seas and I'm going to raise the skies and whatever the <laughs> messianic stuff was. But that's all gone now. There is no Messiah. <laughs> There's no, there's no magic. Uh, and so we have an amazing circumstance. We now have two pollsters, Pat Cadell, who worked for Jimmy Carter, and Doug Schoen, who worked for Clinton, writing column after column now, begging Obama not to run. Make way for Hillary, they say. <laughs> Their theory is that Obama can't win. He probably doesn't even, he's not interested. They think he's, uh, but they, they did it the wrong way. They insulted him. Obama's a narcissist. You don't go to a narcissist and say, you've blown it. You're inconsequential. You're incompetent. You are a boob. You have screwed it up so bad, you've got to leave. You don't tell a narcissist that. What you do is you write a column and you say, you know what, this job's beneath you, Barack. This, this president thing, so beneath you. Well, I mean, you've got to work with these numbskulls in Congress. You can't get anything done this way. And we're not China. We're not a dictatorship yet. You're really wasting your time. This job's so beneath you. You need to move on to the IMF. Look what happens at the Sofitel if you get the IMF. Move on, play basketball whenever you want to play basketball. Maybe move on to the United Nations. Look what happens to those guys. Well, you can any number, but what, this is just, that's where you have to do it. I told him this. I said, if you really want to get rid of Obama, you've got to do it that way. You can't tell him he's blown it. He's just going to firm up and say, oh, yeah, watch this. And he's going to destroy it even more. Even more. But they want him out. The smart, and there are some, very few, but there are some Democrats who realize that he's not only damaging the country, he is destroying the Democrat Party. He is, folks. Now, that alone's not enough because, as you know, they've stocked the judiciary the bureaucracy with career liberals who are going to be there no matter what happens to the party for a long time. That's, that's always been their election uh, insurance. And I, somebody said to me the other day, well, don't you consider it a great victory that uh, Barney Frank's seat is now wide open? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I loved... <laughs> you guys know... Almost 90 years to the day, Margaret Sanger was arrested on this stage. Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood. You know what she was arrested for? Discussing contraception among a mixed sexual audience. My, how times have changed. <laughs> arrested for that. That's what makes me think of Monty Frank. But... Um, or Barney Frank made me think. But anyway, so I loved, I loved, Barney's, I loved Barney's press conference the other day. He said, I just... <laughs> I just... I just... I can't, I can't abandon the fisheries. Can't abandon the fisheries. So... <laughs> now that's 17 Democrats in the House. They're just outright retiring. Now, Barney's quitting. <laughs> Barney, Barney's quitting because of redistricting, and he's never had to really campaign for his office. They've, they've reduced Massachusetts uh, districts from 10 to 9. And uh, yeah, this 2010, I'm telling you, that, that's, that, the, the Democrats took a shellacking, but they, you know, the, the media doesn't portray it this way, so it, it's not really widely understood. You know, we have to, 
tell ourselves each and every day that we are the majority, that we are the ones who are dominant. Because if you don't tell yourself, you're not going to believe it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you go. You've got, you've got, I mean, even... F <sighs> now, I'll be real careful here. I don't know who's in the audience. Um, pretty much anywhere you go in the media, anywhere now, you are going to find dominant liberalism somewhere. It's just there, and it, it's depressing to people. It, it, can, it can wipe away uh, the good feelings of victory. It can, make, it, can, it, can, it can do a lot. You have to constantly work at me too. Might surprise you, but it, 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 it's, it's just you watch enough of it and you get a completely different picture of what is actually going on in the country. Obama's approval number, for example, is now exactly where Jimmy Carter's was. <clears throat> but do you see that reflected anywhere? I mean, you might see it reported, but when George Bush hit these numbers, like Wolf Blitzer could barely keep his pants up reporting it. <laughs> he was going on and on, counting it down. And here we are, it's 5 o'clock at CNN, and Bush's approval numbers are down to the high. It's 5.10 at CNN, and George Bush's approval. They whisper. Barack Obama's numbers are down, and then they do the next 30 minutes is on what does Obama have to do to come back? What can Obama do? I saw Chris Matthews with that, that famous interview now. And I'm shouting at the TV. He says, you know what? I'm really worried. Barack, what are you going to do in the second term? He hasn't told us. I said, I said what is this us? What are you going to do about deficit reduction? What are you going to do about spending? What are you going to do about health care? But I'm, I'm watching this in incredulity. What are you going to do about spending, Chris, more of it? What, what's he going to do about deficit control? Nothing. He wants more deficit. He wants more spending. He wants more debt. The whole Democrat Party does. They want as many people dependent on them as possible. They, they have a whole... This is why I told my friend there's no compromising with these people. I don't, I don't care who it is. You pick any name on that super committee. I don't even remember all that were there, but this guy, my friend, said, what about John Kerry? I said, you got to be kidding me. John Kerry? You came by here on a Saturday before dinner to tell me that you, well, it's going to have to be somebody like you. We're going to, because, and I said, you know what? Did somebody send you here? I was dead. Did, I, did somebody send you here? Did somebody, because they know that I like and respect you. Did somebody send you here and, 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 and tell you? Because if they did, you're being used. I said, what would you do? Let's say I called you and I want to come by and see you. And I came to your house and I said, you know, Zeke, I'm really worried about country. I'm so worried. I mean, I almost started crying, folks, when he was telling them. So worried about country. Uh, this Obama's this is an utter disaster. We're going we're gonna to have to find a way. And I said, Zeke, Why don't, why don't you go talk to Pat Buchanan and find out what you can agree with him about? <laughs> now, that telling Zeke to go talk to Pat Buchanan uh, is like telling the Ohio minister. You know, and he, what do you mean? I said, well, that's what you're asking me to do. Why, why is it me? Why do I have to compromise what I believe when I firmly believe that every problem we're having is traceable to Barack Obama, John Kerry, Chuck Schumer, the Democrat Party, and half of the Republican Party? Not just, folks. And by the way, I said to him, it's not just the Democrats 
we've got a problem on the Republican establishment too. We've got, we got, we have plenty of big government establishment Republicans who are perfectly satisfied with the status quo, who view their only job as winning an election so they are in charge of the money, so they have the committee chairmanships. Folks, and this, is, this, is, this really is, is true, um, and it's been an, I, I'm 60, and I am, strangely enough, I'm still learning. Uh, I know many people think I know everything by now, but I am still, and I can't, I can't tell you what a shock it was, and it, that was not that long ago. <sighs> Ten years, I was shocked to learn that not every Republican's on the same team. Now, I know they're rhinos. I don't mean the rhinos. I know the rhinos are liberal Republicans. But I was stunned. I mean, we, we have people that call themselves conservatives in the media. Uh, they're not on my team. I look at what they write, what they say, and they're, they're not interested in the same things I am. They make fun of a lot of people I believe in, a lot of things I believe in. I said, well, okay, what? Well, they live in Washington. Okay, that's interesting. Part of the Beltway, interesting uh, establishment. It's a whole culture there. Government's the center of everybody's life. Huge amounts of money, huge power to be in control of all of that money. However you wish to use it or however you wish to siphon it for yourself, which as we know happens. So it's not just the Democrats, but ideologically it is. And I finally, I, I told, uh, told my friend, and this, this, it was, this was hard for me. And I'm, I, I'm not a, uh, uh, by choice, confrontational person. Uh, I generally let them say what they want to say and uh, try not to ruffle feathers, particularly among friends, you know, the whole politics, religion thing. But this guy, I'm still not sure. I'm, I'm still, I'm wondering if he was sent because uh, he works with people from across the political spectrum. He's not a political guy. But this happens now and then. You know, I, people do approach me, and I sometimes, if I, if I, last 10 years, had switched and become a liberal, how rich I'd be. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't worry, I wouldn't do it. But I, I, I said, here's, here's the problem. As I, as I see it. And I said, there really is no other way to look at this right now. And I'm just going to tell you what you said to me. You came here and you are worried about the country. And he was crying. He was worried. Everybody that has any concern for this country knows damn well that something is dramatically, terribly wrong. This is not how this country is supposed to operate. This is that we don't have presidents that run around apologizing for this. We don't have presidents that tell the chai comms that we are lazy. We don't have, this is not the kind, we don't have presidents that don't believe in America, that don't believe in American exceptionalism. This is a first, and people instinctively know this is just not right. But, but at the same time, at the same time, it's the president, and people can't, also get their arms around the fact that we've elected somebody like this. So you have to be very careful when you tell people if you believe what I believe, when you tell them these things. And, and uh, this guy, I, I, I said, our problem is not that we don't get along. Our problem is not that people aren't compromising. My party is full of them. We nominated, in 2008, a guy who'd love to walk across the aisle. Where did it get us? The media loved this guy until he got our nomination, and they set out to destroy him. We've given you our best compromisers, Zeke. And all you do is destroy them, too. He said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be including you with this one. So the Democrats, they're not desirous, Zeke, of compromising with me. They want to destroy me. They've been trying for 20 years. 
They want to destroy all of us professionally. If that doesn't work, they'll try to do it assaulting our character. Doesn't matter. But I said, Zeke, don't worry. He said, because he asked me, he said, do you worry about your safety? Sometimes talking like this. I said, no. I tried to kill myself once and I failed. It can't be done. <laughs> he chuckled. I said, Zeke, this, this is a, a battle of ideology. And I said, that's your problem. You don't want to be considered an ideologue. You want to be thought of as open-minded. You agree with some things people on the right say, and then you agree with some people on the left. You want to be seen as an open-minded, centrist, moderate, who sees the best of both sides, except, Zeke, you don't see anything good on my side. You've come to me telling me I need to compromise. You don't see anything bad on this, and I'm here to tell you that if this country is to be saved, and by that I mean if this country is to be preserved as founded. Folks, there's always going to be an America. Don't misunderstand. But is it going to be the America of a constitutional founding that we've all grown up with and expect, or is it going to be a European socialist quasi-democracy? I mean, that's the option that we face here. And I said, Zeke, if... Oh, it's, if I'm leaving out something very crucial, he's, he's scared to death about Europe. He's telling me that, well, fresh, I'll tell you, one of those countries goes, that's going to mean bad things for us. And I said, what do you mean if one of them goes? I said, the Italians can't pay the bonds that they sold. Who would have ever thought, could you believe this, that Poland is asking Germany to bail them out? Who would have ever believed? In our lifetimes? Zeke, if, if these people that you want me to compromise with aren't stopped, we are Greece. We're going to be Italy or we're going to be Spain. And the thing is, this is where our president wants to take us. What is so hard to understand about this? I... Really, really, do you really mean this? Yes. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have said this to you or things like if you hadn't called me, but you came by here and this, this sob story about how we've got to compromise, and I know it's you think I'm the one that ought to do it, but I don't want to compromise. I don't see anything worth compromising with. I see only something that needs to be defeated. This is an ideological battle. This is freedom versus socialism. This is freedom versus tyranny. And the tyranny is represented by Obama and the Democrats. And he said, well, you think the Republicans are all... I said, no, 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 the Republicans aren't innocent. There are a bunch of Republicans too stupid to see what's going on who would probably agree with you that I need to compromise. I don't want you to think that, that he said, but you, you sound so sure of yourself. I damn well am. How can you not be? How can you come here and tell me about Europe and tell me you're fearful for the country and you don't like Obama and then tell me that I've got a compromise? How can you do this? I said, in your heart, you have to know or you wouldn't have come here at all unless you're making it all up, which, which he wasn't. Um... We got a guy who claims he's focusing like a laser on jobs. <laughs> and he wants to create jobs. Well, no, I'm just in a, in a common sense way. Would somebody show me the evidence? He has no desire to create jobs. He profits. He benefits from chaos. He says to the Occupy people, I ran for you. Or you're my people, whatever he said to him. That's what he seeks. You know, you and I, uh, I'm going to assume that most of you in this room agree with me on this. If you don't, you will before it's over. <laughs> uh, and, and, and for those of you that don't agree or don't understand, let me tell you what my motivation is. My motivation is, is not to defeat anybody. My motivation is not to win uh, it, it's, it's, it's pure. I, 
and I speak for, I think, most of the people in this room, we have an absolute profound, overawed love and respect for this country and the way it was founded. <laughs> Pure and simple. And... And we don't hate anybody. We want everybody to prosper and do well. The, this country, I you know, I, I hate to tell you this too. I, uh, I am so naive. I, I genuinely, really am naive. But I can't for the life of me understand. And I've tried to. I've done the intellectual exercises. I've, I've tried uh, imagining being in other people's shoes. I can't understand people hating this country, people born here hating the country. I just, it doesn't compute. I don't understand it. I've heard all of, I've, I've heard all of, well, it's established slavery. No, we wrote a constitution and got rid of it. We lost 500,000 citizens getting rid of slavery. We're the country that's gotten rid of. We, did, we went to war with ourselves over it. We, we've, we feed the world. We clothe the world. But yet there are people, and I know why they're taught this, the Occupy crowd. They go to school or taught this sometimes starting in junior high. Sometimes the Saturday morning cartoons, Ted Turner's Captain Planet, was all about how corporations are polluting the planet because they want everybody to die. Imagine, and we actually have numbskulls who think that corporations exist to kill their customers. <laughs> I, I, I know that, that there, and, and by the way, the president is one of these people. <laughs> the president and people who think like him don't think of America as exceptional because they think America is a crime. They think America is immoral. They think that America became a superpower and an exceptional place by stealing other people's stuff. We stole their oil. We stole their... What else did we steal? They said, well, uh, we stole their corn, uh, we conquered them and we uh, imprisoned them uh, with imperialists. They believe this. They believe that this country, and by the way, have you ever sat alone? Have you ever, this is an amazing thing to me too. Have you ever asked yourself how it is that in less than 250 years, a single population of under 300 million people so dominated the planet for good. There are populations, countries, civilizations that have been around thousands of years. Our DNA is no different than theirs. We're not inherently smarter we're not a special species. There's nothing different about us. The only thing that's different, well, not the only, but it's where we live, where we grow up now. But that doesn't explain, how can this happen? I mean, the ancient Romans did some good stuff. But look at the advancement in the world, in the standard of living, in the 19th and 20th centuries alone because of the United States. Now, how did this happen? What makes this happen? What makes it possible? There's a reason for it. Who, who, who said freedom? If I, if I were Obama, I'd say, how foolish can you be? Freedom, what's that worth? Freedom is actually a large part of it, a major part of it. 
but it was also the founding of the country. It was the concept, the entire set of principles, the belief in humanity that went into our founding. And it's right there in our Declaration. It says it all. We are all endowed by our Creator. Ergo, there's a God. We are all endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life. Ooh, that's a problem for Molly Yard. <laughs> life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Now I ask you, which ideological movement today advances the concept of life? It ain't liberalism. Which ideology advances the concept of liberty? It ain't liberalism. In other words, it's not the Democrat Party. And which movement is advancing the whole notion of the pursuit of happiness? Well, it ain't them. They are never happy. Have you ever seen them smile? <laughs> Yet, so, it really, the founding of this country is a miracle. You and I know it. What is American exceptionalism? Everybody has their own definition for it. I'll tell you what mine is. The rule for human beings since the creation of time, since the creation of the planet, the normal standard operating procedure has been tyranny, dungeons, oppression, poverty. The vast majority of the people who have ever lived in this country, in the world, who have ever lived in the world, have been imprisoned or dictated toward, lived under tyranny, have been poor. It, 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 it's been the standard. The exception to that has been the United States. The exception to what life was like for most every human being has been the United States of America. That's one definition of American exceptionalism. It's not that we're better than anybody else. This is what Obama and the Democrats don't like. They think we're saying we're better people. No, 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 no. We're luckier. We have a country that was founded by brilliant people who understood that we were blessed by God. And they... So I don't... It's the whole notion, the whole notion of hating the country. I honestly... I know it exists. I know there are people out there who hate this country and don't like it. Intellectually, it doesn't compute. And it saddens me to no end. But I know that they believe that this is a country that has stolen from every other country that we have raped and pillaged and that we have conquered and that we have murdered and all this other thing. Uh, no concept, no understand, because they're not taught of the wonderful things this country has done for the rest of the world. The standard of living that we've brought to ourselves and people around the world. And at some point, you have to say, okay, I'm not going to waste my time trying to persuade them anymore. I'm just going to try to see to it that those people remain few in number and can't win elections. Because that really comes down to that. So it's, a, it's, for me, it's an ideological battle. It's, and I, 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 I think this is one of the problems I have with the Republican presidential candidates. <clears throat> I really think that if there was one of them who would simply, proudly, cheerfully, happily, confidently, extol conservatism morning and night, no stopping this person. Um, you know, Newt, Newt right now is the, um, uh, the, the next, as I was saying earlier to Newt, the new not Romney. And folks, I, I have, I, look at, this is true, you, you, if you, no matter what poll you look at, 70 to 75 percent of Republican voters don't want Romney, yet Romney is leading everywhere. Now, the, the, it's, that's a fascinating thing to me. 
And it looks like, if you had to say so sitting here right now, given everything we know, it looks like Romney's going to be the nominee. But seven, look, see, 70% of the Republicans don't want that to be the case. So how can this be? How can this happen? Well, uh, some of the vagaries of politics can't be taken out of this. Money, time, Romney has lost enough elections to learn how to win them. He's been at this a long, long time. He's very polished. Uh, those things matter. You know, politics is a business. Uh, it, it, it has a ladder of success, like every other business has. And everybody says, well, we need outsiders. It's tough, because it's a business. There are certain requirements that politics has for success. And it's tough for somebody who's never done it before to move in and know how to do it and survive and prosper, triumph, and get to the top. So that's why it's made up of people who are trying it two and three and four times. Now, Newt. Uh, I, I got a note today from a friend, uh, Rush, uh, I don't know if you hurt your shoulder today. No. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, Mark, Mark Stein was really brutal. <laughs> well, what are the Liberty Square? <laughs> you know, when you see that, when you see that, I wonder why am I paying thousands of dollars for security? <laughs> and then, um, there's one of... You know, I have a cochlear implant, and I can't hear what they're saying. So. But it's, it's, it's a sad thing. These are people threatened by the truth. And it's, that's... It really is... It's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. These are the people who think you owe them everything. These are people who have some kind of... Uh, of an entitlement mentality, and this is what they've been taught. This is what the education system has done to them. It's, it's, it's festered their resentments, and everybody wants to matter, everybody wants to be something, everybody wants to have relevance, and they know they don't. And so they try to uh, disrupt the things that are working. Now, I always you know, I, I, I look at the Occupy crowd down there, and they've all got iPhones or computers when I want. How, did, how do they think that stuff happened? You know, they're out there protesting the very people and things and system that made it possible for them to have those things. Where do they think this stuff comes from? And See, this is why... This is, this is exactly why... And I have people like this call the radio program sometime, and all they're doing is reading scripts from the latest George Soros email or from the latest uh, left-wing website. You can't, you know, I used to, people say, why don't you take the opportunity to try to persuade them? Why don't you, it's not, you can't do it. That's not why they're here. They're not here to have their minds. They're not, they're not here to even be exposed to the other side. They're just taking advantage of a tumultuous time in the country to make it even more chaotic. I mean, there's your average Obama voter. That's somebody that's... So... At any rate, evidence here again that the, the, the key to preserving what we all love is to admit that we're in ideological battle. It's not just Republicans versus Democrats uh, or whatever third party that might spring up. It is a definite. We are faced with a 
a challenge of a creeping tyranny and a socialism that has quite a few citizens supporting it and behind it, but not as many as you would think. They're made to look larger in number than they are. And people ask me uh, how I stay optimistic. And I said, well, I've got a couple of reasons for it, a couple, because I'm not naturally optimistic. Most people aren't. Um, and especially during times like this. But if I, I look at the things that have happened to me in my life, I mean, I quit college after a, a semester. I hated it. I knew what I wanted to do from the time I was eight years old. I hated school. I despised it. It was prison. It was conformity. It was what everybody else had to do. It was, I'd go to school and I'd panic over having to paste two pieces of pages together. <laughs> I, I'd look out the window and I would see the repair vehicles driving by or whatever and I, gosh, can I be on one? What is it like to be out there? I just hated it. And I'm getting ready for school every morning, my mother had the radio on and a guy on the radio was having fun. He was enjoying things. He sounded like he was happy to be up. I wasn't. I was miserable that I had to go to school. So uh, I ended up getting a part-time radio job when I was 15 at a local radio station, and they couldn't kick me out of it. They could not keep me. I skipped my senior year in high school a consecutive four weeks and I got it excused. I got the absence excused. My mother took my car away from me when she found out I was skipping ballroom dance in college. I hated it. I despised it. I didn't like it at any, I flunked speech twice because I didn't outline. I gave all the speeches and I showed up but they said, you didn't outline them. I said, what is this, outline 101 or speech? I'm doing the speeches. Well, you're not conforming to the class and the way it's supposed to be. No. So my father thought that he was a failure. As a father, because I quit school, he sat me down. Remember now, he was born in 1918. The formative experience of his life was Great Depression, World War II, uh, and during the Great Depression, if you didn't have college education, you didn't have a prayer. And he was just scared to death. And I was the, you know, you see people even today, athletes primarily, after an event, they've been the star, they're being interviewed. Yep, and I'm the first in my family to go to college. And everybody goes, Where did you go? I'm the first in mine not to. <laughs> and I'm the only, I'm the only one in mine not to. So I hear my father say to me, son, if you do this, you're going to lose all your friends. They're going to surpass you intellectually and socially. They won't have anything in common with you, and they won't care to be around you. They're going to go on to school, and you're going to be a bum. You won't find a decent girl to marry. After all, son, imagine this, this day and age. What woman wants to marry a man who can't support her? <laughs> if I could have only told him what awaited me in the 70s when feminism hit. So he told me all these things, and, and, and he was dead serious. And he had uh, hearing loss. So all of my years on the radio, he, he, never, he couldn't hear me. He had to listen to my mother tell him what was going on in my career. But it didn't mean anything to him. Radio was the lowest rung of the showbiz ladder. Television. If you're going to do media, television. Walter Cronkite. Oh, geez. <laughs> my grandfather, too. Well, do you think you'll ever uh, meet Walter Cronkite? I don't know. I'm not. I mean, at the time, I'm playing Donny Osmond records as a disc jockey on the radio. So... But I loved it. I loved radio, and that's all I wanted to do. And I knew it's what I was best at. I quit once, well, I got, <laughs> I got fired 
for like the fifth time, and I said, okay, I'm too old, I was 28, too old to be a DJ, I went to work for a baseball team in sales, Kansas City Royals, sales and marketing, and for the first three years it was, it was great, but then after that, um, it was a corporate structure, conformity, I learned that I wasn't made for it. So I quit and went back to radio, and for the first time started spoken word format rather than uh, playing music. And I said, I want, I, I want to find out once and for all if I can be the reason people will listen to the radio. So I'm not going to do any guests. I'm not going to talk about carrot cake recipes during the holiday season or any of this other gunk. I'm going to do what I want to do, what I think is interesting, and I'm going to roll the dice. And I did, and this is the result. This worked. Now, that's why... You might think I lost my place. That's why I'm optimistic. The reason I'm optimistic, look at what I get to do every day. I, I, get, I get to go on the radio every day, and I get to talk to you and 25 million other people about what's happening in the country. I get to tell myself that I have a chance, I have a shot at shaping public opinion every day. How could you not be optimistic with that? Well, Rush, what do you do when the Democrats win? Well, you, you can't win everything, and I, I, don't, my, 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 I don't define success that way. I'm just saying that's how I stay optimistic. I mean, success in radio is real simple. You attract the largest audience you can. You hold it for as long as you can, so you can charge confiscatory advertising rates. <laughs> that's it. And I managed to do that, too. <laughs> but I'm optimistic uh, because I just, I, all, I have faith in the American people. I mean, even in the 2008 election, I, got, I was, like a lot of you, I'm sure, was, oh my gosh, is this the end? Have we reached the tipping point? Do we really have a, a number of people that are going to fall for this kind of thing? That, actually believe this kind of person that we've never seen in politics before, that this is so unique and so... And I came to understand that what that was really all about was that people uh, were just so fed up. The media had succeeded in creating all kinds of hatred for George W. Bush, and Karl Rove admits it, big mistake, they never fought back, they never defended themselves. So the people that voted for him and invested in him never felt defended. Attack Bush, you attack the people who voted for him and support him, and they didn't respond to it, didn't want to sully the office, they said. So the war in Iraq, people got tired of that, and hope and change, and what did Obama run on, by the way? Well, he's going to bring everybody together, we have this unity, uh, America's going to be loved again, the world isn't going to hate us, we're going to lower the sea levels, we're going to have green energy, yes, we're going to have energy that's never going to pollute, and furthermore, nobody's ever going to die, because I'm going to have a health care plan that's not going to cost anybody anything, and the premiums are going to go down, and nobody's going to get sick. And if they do get sick, they're going to get cured, and it's not going to cost anybody anything except the rich. And we're going to have utopia. And people said, I'm up for it. <laughs> but they don't think that anymore. Uh, if they still did, I wouldn't be as optimistic as I am. But the Obama coalition is gone. The people, including the youths of America that so blindly supported them, they're gone. All he's got left is this ragtag bunch out there that wouldn't know a job if it slapped him in the face. That's all he's got. Of Don't forget. You really probably some people in the audience say, how can he be so mean? It's not mean, it's the truth. But you have, at the same time, you, you, you've, you've got this do not doubt me on this. <laughs> this New York Times story of Monday, the Obama campaign writing off white working voters. Now, in, in the past, in the past, folks, that's always meant union people. In Democrat terminology, in their lexicon, you know it as well as I do. When they talk about working people, they mean unions. The kind of people that are... 
You know, everywhere there's a mess in this country, you're just going to find a union. I, just, I know, but... And I don't mean the rank and file. I'm talking about the leaders and their own political agenda and the way they've used the dues money that's siphoned from all the rank and file. But regardless, um, when they say, when they put it in the New York Times that their coalition will not include, they're not going to try to appeal. They are not going to try to get the votes of white working Americans. Now you let, you let George W, we, let Newt Gingrich or any Republican candidate say, you know what, we've just come up with our strategy for victory and we are gonna abandon black African American working Americans. They are not part of our, can you imagine the hell that would descend on them? There would be no end to that. There'd be hell to pay for it. But the White House can put this out, okay, well, if we can't win with white working Americans. Now that tells me that the magic, the Obama coalition that exists in 2008 is gone. And what that tells me is that they really think their only chance of victory is appealing to this intellectual elite of artists, like actors, singers, you know, the backbone of America, the real brilliant, the Kardashians of the world. <laughs> and then, of course, the uh, university professors. But after that, they're going the minority dependent route. And this story, by the way, singled out Hispanics. As, as a group that they're going after. That means they, meet, they need as many non-working, dependent people as possible that they can blame the Republicans for, which is what's happening. There's, there's, it, does, we all know, two and a half years ago, if we wanted to, we know what we have to do today. If we had as a national policy job creation, you and I know exactly what we would do. We'd do it tomorrow, we would unleash the job creators, and in six months, the trend would be like this. You couldn't stop it. We all know what to do. This bunch will not do it, no matter what the cost, no matter what the purpose, because it's not their objective. And I'll say, well, what do we do, Rush? What? It's very simple. Take a, try this. There's, this is just one thing, one of many things that we could do. The regime is wasting, what, $1.8 trillion a year? That's how much we're spending that we don't have. Okay, $1.8 trillion. Now, the amount of revenue taken in each year by the income tax and a couple other tax thrown is around $2 trillion. So, let's just cancel all income taxes and a couple others for a full year. Just to, let's pay for it, then. let's let the people keep the money instead of sending it to Washington for deficit spending. Let the people, that's one thing. Obama actually said, you know, the Republicans are talking about reducing regulations on business to create jobs. I don't know what they're talking about. Well, we do. If you take the shackles off of people, what do we want people to do, hire? Obama thinks you get people to hire by promising them a tax deduction. Here's his deal. Obama says, small business, I'll give you a $2,500 tax credit for every veteran you hire. Well, you love veterans, but why not everybody you hire, number one. Number two, businesses don't hire for that reason. They don't hire for tax breaks. They hire because they got work that needs to be done. And right now, there's no work that needs to be done. Furthermore, a small business guy is going to say, okay, I'm going to go hire somebody. It's going to cost me minimum 50 grand by the time I throw in health care and other benefits. And I'm going to get $2,500 back for this. <laughs> Doesn't compute. It's not how you stimulate job growth. But a statist, somebody that's entirely ignorant and disdainful of capitalism, like Obama and his buddies will look at it exactly that way. So there's, 
you, you have the, the, the Reagan years, the model of tax reduction, creating more taxpayers, more revenue. But what to do to create jobs is simple. And it's, 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 it, it breaks my heart to hear that this is the new normal. I, the labor secretary, the former labor secretary, Robert B. Reich. <laughs> I was just waiting for somebody to do that. He, he came out and said, it. well, for those of you that don't know, <laughs> Robert, Robert Reich used to have, a, he's a former labor secretary for, for Clinton and a uh, former lecturer at Harvard, and he used to have a commentary on the McNeil Era News Hour. And at the end of his commentary, in order to give himself stature and uh, try to have a signature about himself, this is Robert B. Reich. So, you know, I love impersonating people, and the key to that is exaggeration. So whenever I mention his name, I just say, Robert B. Reich. Duh! But he said, he said just today that we're looking at the new norm. 9% unemployment? Sorry. Uh, unacceptable. Why do we have to settle for this? And we don't, folks. We don't have to settle for any of this. We don't have to settle for 9% unemployment. We don't have to settle for an incompetent in the White House. We don't have to settle for somebody that doesn't respect the country. We don't have to settle for somebody who doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. And we don't have to settle for people who don't understand it. You know, it's a, I, I started out by telling you uh, that it's tougher for me to find the fun factor each and every day because I, I, I can't help looking at it as being so serious. I'm, I'm 60 years old. Uh, and I'm trying to do as much as I can with what I have to reverse the trend that we're on and, 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 and save the country from the encroachment that we face from the left. And uh, part of me regrets that, that it's... it's, it's taken on such a uh, serious tone. Fun factor's not gone, but it does, it matters a tremendous amount to me. And I take it as seriously as I ever have, maybe more so than ever. And I just want you to know, that in all of this, that I am so thankful that you all are in the audience and that you've done for me what you have. I have people tell me frequently that um, what I've done or the radio program, it, it means so much to them, and I appreciate that. But in all candor, uh, and I say this every chance I get, no matter what uh, my radio program has meant to you, if it's meant anything, pales in comparison to what you have meant and do mean to me and my life and my family's life and, and my success. I, I pinch myself every day with the good fortune that's happened to me. And it's, it's all due to people like you, who are not only in the audience, but you admit it. <laughs> when asked. And So, thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I want you to, uh, again, accept my apologies for, for starting late, but it was the weather and a number of other things. And I, uh, I, I, I promised everybody I'd have everybody out of here by 9 o'clock, and it's 9.35, but that's because we started late. So, folks, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I, I love you more than I can possibly say. Thank you all very much.